praises to God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. All praise to Him who reigns above in majesty supreme, who gave His Son for man to die, that He might man and my salvation whom shall I fear the Lord is the strength of my life of whom shall I be afraid therefore I will offer sacrifices of joy in his tabernacle I will sing yes I will sing praises to the Lord let's do that right now you hear me when I call you are my morning song the dark fills the night it cannot hide the light who shall Oh 
so glad all of you have joined us today whether you're in the room right now or watching us online thank you for being with us today and every Sunday we have guests with us whether you're new in person or new online or maybe it's uh, your first time back in a while but we're glad that you've joined us today for this time of worship we'd love to connect with you and you can do that either in person right now or even at home you can text the word connect to the number that you see on your screen and we can get in touch with you that way and begin a communication with you or today right after the service uh, if you'd like to meet our pastor he's gonna be at the next steps room and he'd love to visit with you right at the end of our service today Bill Baker our chairman of deacons is coming up to give us a special presentation I'm so excited about what is happening next Bill come on up hi I'm Bill Baker the deacon of our uh, uh, deacon council chairman and on January the 31st, the Deacon Council, along with many of our ordained pastors, met to hear Sam's testimony, to examine him. We heard from dozens 
of uh, deacons who could speak to Sam's character and calling uh, as he grew up in this church. And with, I'm proud to announce that with unanimous consent, the deacon council and those pastors recommend Sam for ordination into the ministry. Yeah, that's awesome. Thank you, Bill. Thank you. This is a very special and sacred moment for us as we gather together as the church to come and do what the church does, and that is to encourage and uplift and affirm those that uh, we see God's calling on. It was a very special moment in the New Testament when the Apostle Paul and Barnabas came together and by the leading of the Holy Spirit felt called to their first missionary journey and the church came around them. The church that knew them, the church that had watched them, the church that saw them in action said, amen, yes, you are called. And that's what ordination is. And that's what we're doing this morning. We were coming around our brother Sam that we have, we have seen him grow up in this church in many ways. And we just want to affirm the call that God has on his life to do ministry. He's already doing it, and we've seen it, and we just love you, Sam, and are so appreciative. So, Sam, just talk to us just very quickly uh, about God's call in your life. Yes, thank you, Pastor Ellis, and uh, thank you, church family. Um, it's definitely a, an honor and a blessing um, just to be an ambassador of the gospel and also a representative of your love for the people um, of Latvia. And um, I think this, this particular journey started uh, more than 10 years ago, 12 years ago, on a mission trip led by Galen Clark Red to Latvia. They took a bunch of teenagers, um, like myself, um, and I think, I think for, for me, I didn't, at that time in life, I did not know, I did not know where I fit in in life. I didn't know um, what was next for me. I think my future was kind of uncertain. Um, and on that first trip, um, I think God taught me three things. He reminded me of my love for himself. He reminded me of my love for his people. And he reminded me of my love for music. Um, and all my life, I've been in and around music. I love music. And all my friends that I've met has been through music. And it's funny that God used this thing um, just to show me how much he wants me to um, love his people. Uh, it's through music and through community that I learned where I fit in in God's kingdom and how it can be of service. And so throughout the years, um, I went on that first mission trip, went on more mission trips. I came uh, back and became a member of this church, um, became a member of the worship team, uh, served in the youth ministry, and God just began to taught me, teach me a lot of things about um, who he is and who I am and how I'm to serve in his kingdom. And about three years ago, a good friend of mine, Tuoms Ashnaviks from uh, Latvia, he asked me, um, he was like, how would you like to come and serve with us for a year? And it was um, such a big question because I think God had already been building up a lot. And when he asked that, I believe God was speaking through him. Um, and God uh, kind of confirmed, okay, I think this is what I have set in front of you. This is what I have set for you. Um, and then there's a long story from, from that three years. And God has been teaching me so much. I've had the opportunity to be in Latvia for six months and then uh, another 11 months. And now I look to go back and really get into ministry. And um, I definitely did not want to do that without my church family. Um, and I just, uh, I'm so excited that I get to walk with this journey, walk through this journey with you all, and you get to join me as we both do ministry, um, not only here, and, uh, but in, also in Latvia. And so I'm very thankful for that. I thank you very much, church family. I'm thankful for my family and also my friends for just supporting me all the way through. And I'm excited to see what God has in store for us um, as we move forward. So thank you very much. Thank you, Sam. Thank you, Sam. We do, we do love you and we do affirm you. So we're going to take time now to have our prayer, our ordaining prayer as a church. We are doing this. Deacons have already voted. Church council has already voted. It's gone through all that. And it's just time for us to lay hands and just bless Sam and lift him up. And so if you've been a part of Sam's life, if you would, normally we would, we would be all over Sam, right? And we're, we're not going to lay hands on you literally. Uh, things have changed, but we do want to have your support. So if you know Sam, if you've been a part of his life, if you've been a part of his, feel free to come up on the stage. We're going to ask you to go ahead and come up on the stage. Please keep your mask on, but come up on the stage. If you feel like you're a part of Sam's life and ministry, you're here today. Just come on up here and, and surround him without touching him, <laughs> but surround him. And, um, and we're going to pray. I'm going to pray the prayer of ordination over Sam.
saying, look around you. These are the people who love you, all of us. And uh, we, we stand here to just affirm God's call in your life. We've seen it and we affirm it now. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for our brother Sam and the way that you have shaped him and molded him, the way you've used, you have used all of experiences in, throughout his life, both the good and the bad, to make him into the man that he is today. And we thank you that you've called him to this ministry. We've, we've seen your calling on him. We've seen evidence of that calling. And so we lift him up to you now, Father, and we ordain him to the ministry that you have prepared for him from the beginning of time. Bless him in that ministry. Cover him with your love and your grace and your strength and your power. We pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Sam, has made, Sam has made a commitment to say, Lord, I'm following you wherever you lead. Would you join him in this prayer together? Lord, here am I. Let's sing together. Master, the together today. Amen. In the darkness we were waiting without hope, without light, till from heaven you came running. There was mercy to fulfill the law and prophets to a virgin came the word from a throne of endless glory to a cradle in the dirt praise the Jesus. 
Amen. Praise His name. We're going to be reading this morning um, in the book of Acts. Um, we're going through the book of Acts in our well journal readings, and so we're tracking with that in our messages as well. We're going to be reading from Acts chapter 16. If you want to open your Bible there, you can. But before we do that, before we read that, I wanted to share a little bit about um, another book in the New Testament, the book of Hebrews. Because this week in your well journal readings, I hope you're taking that journey with us. But in, this, in the readings this week, you're going to be transitioning from the book of Acts into the book of Hebrews. And so we're going to spend some time in the book of Hebrews. And I just wanted to let, tell you a little bit about that so you're ready as you, as you go into your readings. The book of Hebrews is a fantastic book to read. You're going to love reading the book of Hebrews. We, we're not sure who wrote the book of Hebrews. We're not sure exactly when it was written, although certainly it was written by the mid-first century. And we're not really sure where he was when he was writing it. Um, we do know a couple of things about him, though. We know that he was most likely a pastor because the book of Hebrews is basically a sermon. Its, it's format is a homiletical form. It's a sermon written by a pastor who's trying to teach something to his congregation. Most likely it was in the area of Judea, Israel, Palestine, because it's steeped in Hebrew tradition and understanding. This pastor who wrote this sermon that we call Hebrews was, was a, a really a, an Old Testament biblical scholar. He really knew and understood the Old Testament. And so what, you've, what, he, what he's dealing with, though, what is happening at that time is that Christianity is expanding and it's growing like crazy all over the Mediterranean world. And, and there's some kind of crazy ideas that are getting mixed up with this expansion of Christianity about who Jesus is. And Jesus is getting all kind of mixed up and people, people, the, the people who are following Jesus, they're, they're equating him like with angels and there's this kind of this weird thing going on about angels and Jesus and some are mistaking him for Elijah or Mo, another Moses or Abraham and so there's all this kind of stuff happening and he writes this sermon to dispel all of that, to give a clear understanding of who Jesus is. And the, 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 the book of Hebrews starts off at the very start with exalting Jesus to the highest place. The book of Hebrews is all about Jesus, that he is, he is above the angels, he is above Abraham, he is above Moses and all who came before him. It elevates Jesus to the highest place. It's interesting that much of what we know and understand about Jesus, theologically speaking, we get from the book of, of Hebrews. It, it's packed full of what we call Christology, understanding about, about Jesus. Um, there's this one place when Paul is, is traveling throughout Macedonia, he stops at a little village called Thessalonica, then he stops at another little village called Berea, but in those villages, it's, the scripture says that he stopped there and he went to the synagogue and he began to explain from the scriptures who Jesus was, that he was the son of God. He proved to them that Jesus was the son of God, the Messiah, from the scriptures. Well, what scriptures are they talking about? Well, they're talking about the Old Testament scriptures, it's the only ones they had. The New Testament had not been written yet. So, Paul proved from the Old Testament scriptures that Jesus was the Messiah. The thing it doesn't tell you in the book of Acts is how he did that. What scripture passages did he use? How did he prove from the Old Testament that Jesus was the Messiah? And guess what? The book of Hebrews tells us exactly how they did that. The book of Hebrews is steeped with Old Testament scriptures about predicting Jesus and who he was and who he is. You're going to have a great time reading the book of Hebrews this, the next couple of weeks. And I pray that you will join us on that journey. But right now, we're in the book of Acts. And so I'm going to be reading a scripture passage that you should have read a couple of weeks ago if you're tracking with us through the Bible reading journey. It's from our well journal. It's from Acts chapter 16. And we're going to read verses 6 to 15. And this is what the Word of God says. Paul and his companions traveled throughout the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching the Word in the province of Asia. When they came to the border of Mycenae, they tried to enter Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus would not allow them to. So they passed by Mycenae and went down to Troas. During the night, Paul had a vision of a man of Macedonia standing and begging him, come over to Macedonia and help us. After Paul had seen the vision, we got ready at once to leave for Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. From Troas, we put out to sea and sailed straight for Samothrace, and the next day we went on to Neapolis. From there, we traveled to Philippi, a Roman colony and the leading city of that district of Macedonia, and we stayed there for several days. On the Sabbath, we went outside the city gate to the river, where we expected to find a place of prayer. We sat down and began to speak to the women who had gathered there, 
One of those listening was a woman from the city of Thyatira named Lydia, a dealer in purple cloth. She was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to respond to Paul's message. When she and the members of her household were baptized, she invited us to her home. If you consider me a believer in the Lord, she said, come and stay at my house. And she persuaded us. And the Lord bless the reading of his word. Um, not long ago, in my house, we were, we were cleaning out the attic. We do this once a year uh, when the Christmas stuff needs to get put back, right? We just pull everything out of the attic and decide what stays, what goes. We have a hard, fast rule at our house. I mean, this is a hard, fast rule that all the Christmas stuff has to go down by Valentine's Day. I mean, it's just... <laughs> Some of you keep it up all year long. I know you do. <laughs> but... If Valentine's Day hits and the Christmas stuff is not up yet, my wife just, she just goes crazy. So. so here we are pulling everything out of the attic and we're deciding we have three stacks, boxes. The one, one stack is what's going back into the attic. Another stack is what's going to be donated that we just don't, haven't used in years, don't need anymore, and to Goodwill or whoever. And then the third stack was, is the stuff that's going to, we're going to throw it away. It's not, it's not even good enough for Goodwill anymore, so we're going to throw it away. So these are the stacks. And we had this one box that we had brought out and it had a bunch of junk in it. It was, it was sentimental value. And so we were trying to decide, what do we do with this box? What stack does it go in? And Priscilla and I, my wife, we were going back and forth about where this box needed to go. My son, Michael, who was helping us, our middle child, he was there. And finally, in, in a certain amount of frustration, Michael just says, well, it has to go somewhere. Right? Well, that's true, isn't it? It has to go somewhere. You have to put it somewhere. And, and I, I started thinking about that with everything in life, isn't it? Everything that you own, everything that you have, you have to put it somewhere, in, including your faith. You have to put it somewhere. So the question is, where, where do you place your faith? And I, I don't mean like where do you place it as in, in whom do you place it? And I'm going to assume for the, for the sake of this sermon that you've already Put, placed your faith in Jesus Christ. I'm going to assume that you know who you put your faith in, and it's Jesus Christ. That's, that's not the question. My question is, having done that, having placed your faith in Jesus Christ, now where do you position that faith in your life? Where on, on that list of everything else in your life that has to be put somewhere, where is your faith in Jesus on that list? And and where does where you place your faith say about you? And what difference does it make? In the Old Testament scriptures, God told his people that they were to place their faith in him at the very top of that list in such a way that nothing else was even a close second. That, that's what the first and second of the Ten Commandments is all about. God begins his law, his spoken word to his people. He begins the law by saying this, you shall have no other gods before me. In other words, you will put me at the top of the list and nothing else on the list will be even, will be even a close second. And once, once he does that, once he establishes that, at the, that's where he starts the law. Then from there, he begins to give you commandments, to give us commandments, his people commandments, on every other aspect of their life. If you read the Old Testament law, right, <laughs> he talks about everything. He, he tells his people what to do on everything, when to wake up, how to wake up, when to go to sleep, what to do before you go to sleep, how to wash your hands, when to wash your hands, when not to wash your hands, what to eat, what not to eat, and if you're going to eat it, how to prepare it, how to kill it and drain the blood and prepare it, and how, how to do, who to sleep with, who not to sleep with. I mean, it's embarrassingly intrusive, this law, where God comes in into every aspect of your life, embarrassingly so, to tell you how you live. Why does he do that? Why does he do that to his people? Because the first and second commandment, you shall have no other gods before me, you shall not create any image to worship, you worship me and only me. That, 
The first and second commandment, see, it sets the stage. And when you place God at the top of the list with nothing else that's even a close second, then God saturates everything in your life and God begins to speak into every single aspect of your life. God gets into the minutia of your life when you have placed him at the top of the list and nothing else is even a close second. So the ancient Hebrew people, you see, for them, God wasn't just someone to be worshipped on Sabbath day. No, no, no. No, not at all. God was a constant in their life. In fact, he was the one constant in their life. And he was in their business in every way imaginable. Now, I tell you all of that to say that this is the way that the Apostle Paul lived before he ever encountered Jesus. He was a Jew of Jew, a Hebrew of Hebrews, uh, circumcised on the eighth day of the tribe of Benjamin. He was, a, he was a Pharisee in training. He was a rising star on the Jewish landscape. And this is the way the Apostle Paul approached life before he ever encountered Jesus. God was at the very top and nothing else was even a close second. So it was natural that after he met Jesus, that now Jesus became the one who was at the top of the list and nothing else was a close second. Paul, you see, before he ever met Jesus, understood that God was at the center of the universe and that God was the glue that held the universe together. And therefore, God is the center of my life and he's the glue that holds my life together. And when he met Jesus, then it became Jesus who was the center of his universe and Jesus was the glue that held his life together. This is why Paul can say, for me to live is Jesus Christ and to die is gain. For me to live is Jesus Christ. So, we learn from him what it looks like to place Jesus at the top of your list in such a way that nothing else is even a close second. We see it here in the passage we read. It's a travelogue. It's a classic travel log of antiquity. You've, there are others. It's, they were traveling and someone was taking notes. Or probably Paul every night would just write in this travel diary what happened that day and where they went and what was going on. And later Luke, who's writing the book of Acts, has that diary in front of him. He has those, that, that travel diary Paul gave to him. And he writes the book of Acts, part of it, from that, that diary. And that's what, we're, that's what we're reading here. That Paul and his companions, they went here and then they went there and they went here and they went there. But as we read this travel log, we begin to get an insight into what, to what it looks like to live a life where Jesus is at the top, top of your list and nothing else is a close second. Paul is on his second missionary journey when we find him here through Asia Minor. He, he goes back with Silas to the churches that he started on the first missionary journey with, with Barnabas and, and, and he wants to strengthen those churches and and help them and encourage them and uplift them. And these churches are in an area of Asia Minor called Galatia and he's He's there ministering to them, and, and he's also get, gaining other followers. Uh, he picks up a few helpers like Timothy and others, and so his little band of missionaries is growing. And then he decides that he wants to go west. He decides to go west, and uh, we don't know what was in Paul's brain. We know that eventually Paul wants to make it all the way to Spain, but we're not sure if he's already thinking about that. He just knows he wants to go west, and so he begins to travel west. And we have this travel log that we're following them, and it's saying well, he wanted to go to Asia, but the Holy Spirit wouldn't let him. The Holy Spirit wouldn't let him go south into Asia, southwest. So he starts to go northwest up to Mycenae and Bithynia. And I know these names don't mean anything to you, but just think of them as counties. And, and so he's, he, he wants to go into Mycenae, but the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Jesus won't let him. And he wants to go north into Bithynia, the Baltic area close to the Black Sea. And he's trying to get up there and the, the, the Spirit of Jesus won't let him. It's almost comical. He just, he can't, he can't go anywhere. And he's like threading this needle. He's literally walking along the border between Mycenae and Bithynia in the northwest part of Asia Minor. And he's headed west. And he ends up at Troas, which is a little fishing village on the Aegean Sea. He's bumped up against the Aegean Sea. He can't go any further unless he gets in a boat. And that that's no small undertaking in that day and time. And so they just stop at Troas and they're just sitting there waiting. Can you imagine what the campfire conversations were like along that trip? Right at night? It's like, 
Timothy saying, what is Paul doing? I don't know. Well, Paul, where are we going? Paul just shrugs his shoulders and says, west, we're going west. Where? Where? I don't know. There must have been some, a certain amount of frustration with this journey. That, that for whatever reason, the Spirit was not letting them go where they thought they needed to go. They end up at Troas, this little fishing village, and they're waiting. Here's what it looks like to live your life where Jesus is at the top of the list and no one else is a close second. That is that you, it is that you, you stay in sync with the spirit of Jesus at all costs. You, you work your life in such a way that you do not get ahead of Jesus. Paul said, for me to live is Jesus Christ. There is nothing else. Nothing else is even a close second. There is nothing like, you know, making G Jesus you, not just your Savior, but your Lord. And frankly, we don't have any problem with Jesus as our Savior. We love that idea. And I want Jesus to be my Savior, and I don't ever want him to stop being my Savior. Amen? It's the Lord part that we struggle with. Make him my Lord, but that's the one I keep wanting to take back, don't I? I keep wanting to grab that one back. I want to be the Lord of my life. Right? When I was a kid, we had this thing called an altar call. You remember those where at the end of service you would come to the front? We, actually, we still, I'm kidding, we still do those, but with the virus, we haven't been doing it. But at the end of the service, you would call people to accept Jesus or whatever decision they want to make, and you'd come to the front. And, and, and pretty regularly, someone would come to the front, and they would say this. They would say, I want to rededicate my life to Jesus. You remember that? People would say that, I want to rededicate my life to Jesus. What does that mean? What does it mean? They were already Christians. They're saying, but I want to rededicate. What it means, I believe, is that they've come to a part in their life where they've realized he's still my Savior, but I've been pushing him away as Lord. He's not been the Lord of my life, and I want to rededicate myself to Jesus being not just my Savior, but my Lord, the one who tells me where to go and where not to go, what to do and what not to do, right? This is, this is where Paul is living, as Jesus is not just Savior, but he is Lord. The Spirit of Jesus will not let us go where we want to go. How many times have you come to that place where you want to go somewhere that you ought not be and Jesus says, don't go in there and you go anyway. My dad will always tell me, that never ends well. Does it? It never does. So they get to Troas, as far as they can go, and then Paul has this vision in the middle of the night a man, a Macedonian man, who's calling him to, saying, come to Macedonia, cross the agency. Macedonia was the body of land mass on the other side of the agency from where they are. It says, come to Macedonia, cross the sea and come to us to help us here. And Paul wakes up in the morning and he's packing up and Timothy and they're going, where, where are we going? What are we doing? We're getting on a boat. Okay. We're going to Macedonia. God has called us. They said, we concluded, based on Paul's vision, that God has called us to go to Macedonia. Now, this is a big moment. I want you to see this is a big, big moment in the story we find in the book of Acts. This is the moment because the Aegean Sea that separated Asia Minor from Macedonia, that Aegean Sea was and kind of always has been the, the border, considered the border between east and west. What's on the other side of the Aegean Sea? Macedonia. What's in Macedonia? Well, the Greeks, Athens. The, the, the seat of philosophical thought in that day and time. Athens is in Macedonia. And if you keep going, it's Rome, Italy, the birthplace of Western civilization. If you study the history of Western civilization in school, you're going to start with the Greeks and with the Romans, the Roman Empire. It is the beginning of the story of Western civilization. And so Paul, as far as we know, is the first one who's taking the gospel. The gospel is now crossing the Aegean Sea, and it's going, and so doing, it's going from east to west, and now it is landed right at the heart of the very beginnings of what we know as Western civilization. This is a big moment. In fact, there are many historical scholars who will say that the story of Western civilization is inextricably tied to the story of Christianity. 
that the history of Western civilization is, in many ways, the history of the Christian movement. And it begins here, where Paul lands in Macedonia. This is the moment when the gospel goes west. So here's what I want to say. Not only when you're living, when Jesus is at the top of your list, not only are you living in sync with the spirit of Jesus, but you're also living in sync with the mission of Jesus. You live your life right at the center of his mission for your life and his mission for the church. It's interesting to me that when you read the story that once they get into Macedonia, uh, the entire tone of the narrative changes dramatically. Did you notice that? When, when they get in, once they get into Macedonia, the tone changes from before a tone of hesitancy, hesitancy a, a, a tone of constraint, we were constrained, a, a tone of uncertainty, we don't know where to go. But as soon as they cross, they have their mission, they cross and they land in Philippi, the tone changes completely. Now it is a tone of certainty, a tone of, of creative action, a tone of determination, you see. It's because now they have landed right at the center of the mission with God. They, before, the spirit of Jesus wasn't letting them go here, wasn't letting them go there. They were out of sync with the mission. But once they crossed the agency, now they are in absolute sync with the mission of God. And it changes everything for them. Watch what they do. Paul's MO, his method of operation, he, Paul had a process everywhere he went. When you read his story, he would land in a village or a city or a town and he would go straight to the synagogue. And he would, he would arrive at the synagogue and he would give his credentials. He was a Jew of Jews, a Pharisee of Pharisees. He was learned. Most of the, in these, most of these little villages, Paul would have been the most well-educated man in the village. Most of these little villages, most of the people were illiterate. There may not even be a person who could read at all. And here arrives Paul from Tarsus, trained in Jerusalem by the infamous Gamaliel. He, he has all the credentials. So he shows them his credentials and says, these are my credentials. So naturally they let him speak. You're going to do, do the sermon this morning. And he gets to do the synagogue sermon. And in his sermon, synagogue sermon, he begins to show from the Old Testament scriptures how Jesus is Lord and Savior and Messiah. That's how he would start. Everywhere he went. And he lands at Philippi. And he goes to ask, where's the synagogue? And there's no synagogue in Philippi. Philippi was the leading Roman colony of that area. It had been named after Alexander's father, Philip. It was, it was, a, it was sitting on the, the major thoroughfare of commerce between east and west, between Rome and the rest of the world. And so it was, it was a major kind of place to be. But, but in order to have a synagogue in any village or city, you had to have at least 10 Jewish men. Sorry, ladies. You had to have at least 10 Jewish men over the age of 12 to, have a, to form a synagogue. So apparently in Philippi, they didn't have enough men, Jewish men, over the age of 12. No synagogue. So he goes out by the river to a place of prayer. And he finds there this little group of women, Jewish and Jewish converts to Judaism, Greeks who are converts to Judaism. He finds this little group of women who are there praying. And he, he shares with them the gospel message. Now, what I want you to see is that Paul, Paul is actually on the chase, right? He's looking for people to talk to. He's on mission. And he, he's, he's, he's going to do whatever it takes to find someone to talk to. He goes to the, where the synagogue should be, no synagogue. So where do I go? He, let's go look by the river, see if anybody's there praying. And certainly, surely he finds someone there. And he's, he's looking, he's going, he is, he, he, they, they don't hesitate to chase on the mission. They will do whatever it takes to accomplish the mission. If, if the place they normally go to isn't there, they pivot and they find somewhere else to go. Anything to find someone to share the gospel. We will do whatever it takes to share the gospel. We had one of those moments in the life of our church last year. In March of last year, almost exactly a year ago where the county said, you cannot meet anymore, uh, anyone, in these numbers. And we had to shut down our worship services. And I'll remind you that before we shut down our worship services in March, we didn't have a single camera in the entire room. We had never been online video-wise. We had nothing. We had to pivot fast. 
where the, we came to the synagogue and no one was here. No, no place to worship. What do we do now? We go to where the people are. Well, where are they? They're online. Let's go there. And, and this, I'm telling you, the leadership of your church, the, the pastors of your church, made an amazing, tremendous, fast pivot to an online worship and preaching and teaching and discipling ministry. We are building a digital campus. We called a digital pastor to head that up so that we can reach people and continue to reach people. By the way, I want you to right now to turn around and look at the guys on the cameras and I want you to give them a round of applause because they have done, yeah. And Ryan, I don't know where Ryan is. Ryan's hiding somewhere. He's, he's the, he heads the whole thing up. Where, oh, it's, oh, okay, there's Ryan over there. Thank you, Ryan. Yeah, Ryan grew up in this church, and it's just an amazing, amazing job. Amazing. The pivot. They even make me look good. I um, mean, you know, that's, that's not easy to do. The pivot, right, that we're going to do whatever it takes to find the people that we can share Jesus with. That's when you're in sync with the mission of God. They, when they reached Philippi, they have their marching orders. There are no more constraints. Where before the Spirit was constraining them, no more constraints now. They can, they can be creative and spontaneous. They can move and go and search and find and chase. No longer are they constrained by the Spirit of Jesus. When you are on the mission of Jesus, the Spirit sets you free. Absolutely sets you free when you're on mission with him. When you're in the right place at the right time, the Holy Spirit sets you free. And Paul and his companions were unleashed on Macedonia and they changed, they changed the world. Because when you're on God's mission, that's when God sets you free. And here's what I want to say at the very end here. I just want to leave you with this last thing. And I want you to think a lot about this one. That when you place Jesus at the top of your list in such a way that no one else is even a close second. When you agree that he is not only your savior, but he is your Lord. Which means like the God of the Old Testament, he can speak into every single aspect of your life. Everything. And when you begin to live your life that way, what I want you to see is that the rewards are both unpredictable and immeasurable. The rewards of living that life with Jesus, unpredictable and immeasurable. Who would have guessed that this is the way the story of Western civilization, if the story of Western civilization is to one degree or another the story of Christianity, then who would have, in the West, then who would have thought that it would have started this way with a, with a little group of women beside the river praying. A little group of women in that culture, in that time, second-rate citizens, no power. This little group of women sitting by the riverside on the grass. You can picture it. They have a blanket out. They have their picnic lunch there because the praying may go past lunch. And they're just sitting there, and they're just they're praying. And Paul comes along, and all of Western civilization will be changed. Who could have guessed? I mean, if you were writing the story of Christianity and Western civilization, you would never, if you were writing it as a kind of a fiction, you would never think to start it this way. With a little group of women by the river praying. And that's because the Holy Spirit is unpredictable. Jesus will move and do in ways you never dreamed possible or you never dreamed that they would start that way. That's why any person that you speak to, any person that you see, do not, do not underestimate what the power of God in that person's life can do. The impact that that person can have on the gospel throughout the world. Do not underestimate the 
the little pastor who led Billy Graham to the Lord as this little gangly child could never have imagined what God would do through that one life, amen? Never underestimate what God can do when you share his love with a person and what God can do with that person. I don't care what they look like. I don't care where they come from. I don't care how low they've sunk or how high they've gone. I don't care how educated they are or how undereducated they are. Never underestimate what the Spirit of God can do with a person. It's unpredictable. And it's immeasurable. Um, Lydia and her entire household were saved that day. They were saved for all of eternity. How do you measure that? How do you measure? You can't measure that. I want, you to, I want you to think about it, this for a while. I'm going to ask, the, I'm gonna ask Andy the, uh, to come on up and we're going we're gonna to have some music because I want you to meditate. They're going to play the invitation song, but we're not going to sing it, at least not right now. I just want you to sit for a moment with this idea. I'm going to ask you to think about a couple of things. This, this living with Jesus at the very top of your list where nothing else is even a close second and how the rewards of that are both unpredictable and immeasurable. And so what I want you to take the next few minutes as the music plays, I just want you to take some time to meditate and to think the people in your life, maybe the very one who led you to Jesus, the people who have influenced you in the way of Jesus, the people who have spoken into your life, maybe in those dark times and those difficult times, maybe you have had, like me and so many, those crossroads moments, those crossroads moments where you could have gone this way or that way and, and, and which way you took made all the difference in the world. And maybe it was a person who spoke to you in that moment and then you went the way of Jesus. I don't know. But I want you to think about the power of that, the people in your life who've invested in you and the people that you've invested in and how the rewards of that are both unpredictable and immeasurable. Spend some time with Jesus now meditating on that. Father, we thank you for your presence, for your great love, for the way you give and give and give. We thank you for saving us from 
our sins, from our self-destructive ways. We thank you for loving us with a never-ending love. And we thank you, Father, for all the people in our lives who have spoken into our lives your truth, for those who have led us and guided us. Many of them have already gone on to be with you. We're so thankful for them. Help us to do the same. Help us to be your light that shines in a dark world in every corner, every crevice, everywhere we go. Help us to live for you. Help us to place you at the very top of our list with nothing else, even a close second. We pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. I pray that God has blessed you today. Thank you for being a part of our worship this, this morning. God bless you, and thank you for being a part of our worship online. We're so thankful for you and joining us online, and we pray that you would continue to do that. Um, and I pray that God will use you this week, that, that you picked up something this morning that God will use for you the rest of this week. Be encouraged in him. If you have some question about the church, about, about God, about Jesus, or about something that was said or done today, any kind of questions you have, I'm going to be in the next steps room, as Pastor Andy said earlier, right outside these doors across the hallway. I'll be right there in the next steps room. Please come by and let me know. Maybe you just need someone to pray for you. We would love to pray for you. Whatever it is, you come by there and let, let us know that you were here and let us know what God is doing in your life. But we're going to go ahead and sing one more time to be dismissed. So Andy, you come and lead us uh, as we're dismissed. so much for joining our online worship experience. Be sure to check us out on social media. And if you have kids, check out our Facebook page and our YouTube channel. There's great stuff on there to engage your kids. Here at First Baptist Richardson, we're committed to serving our community and bringing them the things that they need. To find out more how to serve and how to be a part of our missions opportunities, visit our Facebook page. Guys, we also want you to stay connected to a group. So if you'll go to our website, fbrichardson.org slash online groups, you can find a group, email the leader, they'll invite you to join them. We're all connecting by way of Zoom and other uh, means. We want you to know you are not alone and to be able to fellowship and visit and pray together with others who are in the same situation you're in. Also, while we're in these times, we are still ministering and so your gifts are desperately needed by those we're serving. So if you go to fbrichardson.org slash give, you'll have an opportunity to participate in the offerings that we are sharing with this community as we continue the Lord's ministry. Thanks for watching us today and we can't wait to see you again.